Hello, my name is Martin, Father Martin Brown. Obviously, I'm a monk of Glenstall Abbey. Uh, I've been here since 2001. Um, I suppose my life before Glenstall started at home with my family in Ennis County Clare. Uh, I was one of two, uh, two boys, one older brother. Uh, after school, uh, I went to college in Dublin where I studied history and politics, and I continued doing some uh, research in history afterwards uh, in church history as it happens. Uh, during that time I also got involved in media work in local radio in a syndication service for local radio stations around Ireland producing religious and social affairs interviews, normally just fairly straightforward interviews. Uh, and I was also involved a little bit uh, in my own local radio station at home in County Clare. Uh, Throughout all that time, too, I began to develop an interest in ecumenism, in Christian unity, in the reunification of the divided uh, church. Uh, I'm not quite sure where it came from because uh, growing up, I wasn't particularly aware of other Christians. Uh, my town was uh, very largely Catholic and very largely practicing Catholic. Uh, in my primary school, I think I can remember in the entire time I was there, I can remember one Protestant uh, being uh, around my age, um, and he was only in the school for a year or two. Um, so I didn't have a lot of experience uh, of other Christians as a young person. Obviously that changed uh, when I went uh, to university in Dublin. Uh, I went to Trinity College and I used to often uh, attend uh, Choral Evensong, the Anglican service of evening prayer, which was sung in the college chapel every uh, Thursday evening. And, uh, gradually, uh, something uh, arose in me that was a uh, very strong care and concern uh, for the reunification of the church, for unity uh, with other Christians. Uh, not very developed as an idea, but just a, a sort of a feeling in my gut that has been always there uh, since and has, has, has remained. Um, along with all of that, there was trying to decide what I would do with the rest of my life. I was still young, uh, obviously in university. I spent some years after the degree, as I was saying, doing some further research and that uh, gave me a little bit of space to try and figure out what I wanted to do next. Uh, I'd always thought about the idea of some form of uh, religious or priestly vocation, but I couldn't quite figure where I wanted or where God wanted me to be. Uh, as part of all of that, um, ecumenical interest in my life, I uh, began to learn a bit about the Taizé community, which is an ecumenical monastic community uh, in Burgundy in the southeast of France, very famous for its music in particular, uh, very famous too for its inspirational founder, uh, Brother Roger, who was a Swiss uh, Protestant pastor who founded this community um, in order to be what he called a parable of communion, so brothers of various Christian denominations living together. And I'd always been interested in it, and always interested in its music and in Brother Roger, but I'd never really got around to going there until, until my late 20s. And I went, I think, for the first time in uh, 1999 uh, and loved it. And I remember going back in, 20, in 2000, which was the 60th anniversary of the foundation of the committee. And then various parts of my life began to kind of coalesce in that uh, I brought a recording device uh, in order to try and do a radio interview with Brother Roger. And it was all touch and go whether I would be able to do so. He was very old, he was very, a lot of demands in his time, a very uh, famous man, and it was a significant time, it was the anniversary. But eventually, at the last minute, it was agreed that I could do the interview. And we did the interview and it was fine. But what was more striking and more meaningful for me, I guess, was at the end, when the machine was turned off, uh, we sat in a corner of his room in front of an, an icon of uh, the Blessed Virgin, and he began to improvise a prayer for me based on the questions I had been asking him during the interview. So it was a very special and moving moment. And as I said, various parts of my life were coming together there and that I was seeking what to do next. Uh, I was working at my media stuff. I was in an ecumenical environment. And somehow that week, uh, things clarified for me in a way that 
I had failed to, uh, to understand before uh, that I really was seeking uh, a religious community uh, where there would be a structure of uh, daily prayer at various times during the day. And so very shortly afterwards, uh, I made contact with Glenn Stahl. Because as it happens, because of my ecumenical interest and my local radio work, I had regularly visited Glenn Stahl over the years to participate or report on the ecumenical conference that used to take place here every year uh, at the end of June. So again, lots of different parts of my life are sort of coalescing. So eventually all that worked out and uh, I came here uh, definitively in 2001 and made my first vows in 2002 and solemn vows in 2005. So I'm very grateful uh, for the life that I have had here so far. Uh, it has been very varied. People sometimes think that a particular religious order or religious house, that, that if you join, you, you know the kind of work you're going to be doing. Well, certainly there isn't a single job that I have had to do since I arrived in the monastery that I would ever have foreseen myself doing with the possible exception of being secretary to the Ecumenical Conference. Uh, but over the years, uh, I, I've worked in the school quite a bit, and although I knew when I was joining that the school was a major part of the life here in Leinstall, I had no particular uh, ambition to work in a school. Uh, but so be it. I started working here uh, in the school uh, after my novitiate, uh, teaching Irish and religion a little bit, directing the school choir, and a few other bits and pieces, some administrative roles. Eventually, after a couple of years of that, it became time to uh, go and study some theology. And again, I wanted to do so in, a, in an ecumenical environment. So I ended up going to St. John's College in Durham, which is part of the University of Durham. But St. John's College uh, also includes an, a Church of England theological college, a seminary for Church of England uh, candidates for ministry, uh, and a Methodist study centre for Methodist candidates for ordained ministry. So there was all of them and me uh, living and studying together in Durham. Uh, so that was a very fruitful time, very painful time sometimes when, the, when you're living with other Christians, then the, the theoretical uh, questions about the divisions within in the church become much more real and visceral when you're actually living it and you're sitting uh, beside your brothers and sisters all day living with them, eating with them, uh, but not able to be fully in union with them uh, at the Lord's tables. So that was a very fruitful, but also sometimes very uh, painful time. Uh, I continued uh, for another year after that experience in Durham to do some uh, study in the, in the Catholic Theology Center that's part of the theology department there. So it was a, a good uh, balance of experiences. I came back, not quite sure what I'd be doing next, but uh, for reasons best known to people other than me, uh, I ended up as headmaster of the school on my return from Durham. Again, not something I ever anticipated doing, uh, certainly not something I would ever have asked for or sought, uh, but it was a very uh, interesting, <laughs> often very difficult uh, time, but a very interesting time. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot more actually than I had my previous work in the school when I was uh, teaching and housemastering um, when I had a little bit more distance to be able to be in my office and think and react to things at leisure rather than having to react to things immediately. Uh, I found it a much more, uh, well actually to put it perfectly honestly, I liked the way I was more than, than I did when I was working uh, as a housemaster. Uh, I, uh, I, I, I came to really enjoy the work, uh, the connection with the students, with their parents, with the co with colleagues and the staff. Uh, it was a busy time. We, we worked on, a, on an extension, a major extension to the school, the first uh, in many years. Uh, so there was a lot going on. So eventually uh, the time came to, to move on from that. And uh, I did in 2014 and uh, ended up uh, doing some study the following year just here in the house and was ordained priest in 2015. Did various things for a year or two, spent time as the bursar of the community, uh, continued my ecumenical involvement, uh, collaborating with our, our confreres in uh, Holy Cross Abbey in Ross Trevor, uh, in helping to support and prepare the ecumenical journal One in Christ, which is a sort of a theological pastoral journal on ecumenical topics. And the monks in Ross Trevor and their brothers in Turvey in England are responsible for it, and I joined the editorial board of that and became heavily involved in working uh, with them and with some others uh, in directing that project, all the time while doing the various other things here as well. 
So that uh, interest in matters of Christian unity uh, never went away. And even when we stopped having the annual ecumenical conference here, uh, I was glad to have that opportunity then to, to stay involved in matters ecumenical. I ended up going back into the school for, to be headmaster a second time in 2019, uh, which was even more unexpected than the first one. Uh, but that was okay. I, I've always felt fairly open to uh, doing whatever is asked. Um, I don't say that out of any sense of being a martyr or especially obedient, but just that is life. There are needs. You belong to a household in a monastery and things need to be done. And so uh, if you're asked to do something and you can, then I think you just you just get on with it. And I've been kind of happy to do that most of the time. So it was coming to the end of my time as head. It was agreed this would be a shorter term because it was uh, a second and unexpected one. Uh, so coming towards the summer of 2022, it was we had agreed, I'd agreed with the abbot that I'd be finishing uh, in at the end of the term. Wasn't quite clear what I'd be doing next, and we hadn't even begun to talk about it when somewhat out of the blue, a request came from Rome, uh, from the prefect of the dicastery for the promotion of Christian unity. And that's a strange word, dicastery. Uh, it just means effectively it's the, it's the department in the Vatican that deals with Christian unity, with the search for Christian unity, with ecumenical matters. And so there was a, a request to the abbot to release me for a few years to go and work there to be the official responsible for the Catholic Church's relationships, in, especially with the Anglican Communion and the Methodist uh, World Council. Um, so this was even less expected than any of the other things that had fallen onto my uh, desk uh, over the previous 20 years. But it was, in many ways, the ideal. It's, it's strange and unusual and sometimes difficult to be living outside the monastery, although I'm very happy that in Rome I live in Sant'Anselmo, which is the headquarters of our Benedictine Confederation. It's where the abbot primate has his, uh, his offices. Uh, it's a Benedictine university and uh, college residence, so there's over 100 monks living there. So I live there, so that makes it less difficult to be outside uh, my own monastery. And I work in an office in the Vatican. And, uh, effectively, I'm a Vatican civil servant, uh, which is a strange kind of idea when you think about it. And one often hears about, oh, the Curia in Rome, or oh, they're, they're sometimes painted as these difficult bo boogeymen who are always trying to frustrate uh, things that are happening in the church locally and always trying to control kind of a heavy arm. Uh, thankfully, that has not been my experience, uh, in our department at least. Uh, it's a small enough office. We have a a Swiss cardinal as prefect, an Irish bishop as secretary, and then seven or eight officials from various countries. And each official has a different family of churches or denominations that they're responsible for liaising with. Um, and there's a real uh, passion uh, among uh, those of us who work in the office uh, to take the ecumenical project forward. Uh, the Lord's words uh, in his farewell discourse uh, on the night before his crucifixion in St. John's Gospel, uh, praying to the Father that they may be one, that the world may believe, have long been really important words for those involved in the ecumenical movement, and they really are taken very seriously uh, in our office. So the, the Catholic Church has a huge network of relationships with all kinds of different Christian groups and churches. So uh, with, the, with the great historic churches, the Greek Orthodox Church, the Russian Orthodox Church, various of the older Oriental churches, the Copts, the Armenians, and so on, uh, with, the, with the historic Protestant churches, the Anglican Communion, the L Lutheran World Federation, but also now with many of the newer movements, with uh, independent Pentecostal churches, non-denominational churches, those mega churches you see in America and so on. So we relate in very different ways with each of them. In, in some of them, we're working at a very formal dialogue to try and uh, really resolve theological questions that will bring us closer to being able to be one in uh, sacraments and ministry uh, and full communion. Uh, with others, obviously, we are a lot more distant, but we're trying to grow in understanding uh, and uh, cooperation in areas of mutual concern. So we all have our different areas. As I say, I'm responsible for uh, our relationships with the Anglican Communion and with the Methodists, and also now with the Salvation Army as well, which is a, a much different sort of engagement because uh, they're not structured in the same way that most churches are. And so the kind of things we're trying to do together are quite different. 
but it's, it's a huge privilege uh, to be doing this work. And as I look back over the last 30 years in my life and the various ways in which community and the search for Christian unity and prayer for Christian unity uh, have been woven in and out through my life to now find myself uh, working uh, at this uh, level in Rome uh, on behalf of the whole church, working towards uh, creating uh, closer bonds and overcoming obstacles uh, with other churches so that we may be one, so that the world may believe, is just an incredible privilege and I'm very grateful.